According to archives released by the Vatican Library, the original Greek source material used by St. Jerome to translate the Apostle Paul's epistles into the Latin Vulgate Bible were obtained from the Marcionite Christian Church in the 4th century. But it bears little resemblance to what's in your Bible today. In this episode, we journey back into the past to get the scoop on a still-evolving story of strange bedfellows, creative editing, and a mysterious release from from the Vatican Library. A few years ago, the Vatican was in the midst of an intensive effort to digitize all of the documents held by their library and archives. It was a monumental task spanning thousands of years worth of history, and it continues on to this day. After photographing and scanning the documents, they posted the resulting images on their DigiVatLib website for the public and researchers to view. You can have a look at that for yourself at digi, D-I-G-I, dot vatlib, V-A-T-L-I-B, dot I-T. And one particular group of researchers took an especially keen interest in these documents. They worked for the Marcionite Christian Church, especially trained presbyters, and they were tasked with sifting through every image and archive with a fine-tooth comb, hunting for anything related to two very important documents. Now, these documents would have been in the form of a codex, not a scroll, and they are key documents for anybody with even a passing interest in pre-Nicene Christianity. Both would be written in Greek, which is, of course, the foundational language of all Christian doctrine and dogma. Not Hebrew, not Latin, Greek. Now, one of these documents would simply be titled Antithesis, and it is the treatise written by the namesake of the church, Marcion of Sinope, in the second century, which lays out the facts and arguments proving the deity worshipped by Jews is not the same God as revealed to us through Jesus Christ. You see, verse by verse, it contrasts and compares the Torah, later renamed to the Old Testament, with the New Testament and removes any doubt that their deity is alien to Christianity. In fact, so damning was this book, so earth-shaking in its ramifications, so dangerous to the false narratives being framed by the Judaizers of the time that every copy on the planet was hunted down and burned. Even two Roman emperors, including Constantine, got involved. It was a scorched earth policy that left, quite literally, no stone unturned. To the Judaizers of the early church, it was the most dangerous book ever written. Anybody who read it was struck immediately by its truth and purity, and all came to the inescapable conclusion that whoever these Jews were worshipping, it wasn't our Christian God. Quite simply, the book had to go. Now, the only reason we even know it existed is because the enemies of Marcion were brazen enough to quote entire sections of it verbatim in their zeal to demonize his writings. Discredited frauds like Tertullian and others spent lifetimes attacking the book and its author. In fact, Tertullian wrote no less than five books in a desperate attempt to smear the Marcionites and save the Judaizers from the sunlight of truth. Now, for a deep dive deconstruction on Tertullian and Marcion, I recommend uh, the book, The First New Testament, written by Dr. Jason Badoon. So, in a way, we're thankful that Tertullian's writings survive. I mean, anyway, antithesis was one codex that the researchers were hoping to find in the new Vatican Library releases. After all, if Tertullian had a copy, it certainly stands to reason that his paymaster, the Vatican, would also have a copy. And maybe it would slip out unnoticed in a tranche of related material. Well, such was the hope. Unfortunately, as of today, there's been no sign of it, but the Mercyonite Church is continuing its efforts to find it, even as you hear my words.
Now, the second codex of supreme interest to the church was in many ways even more dangerous to the Judaizers. Hints and clues to its existence can still be found in the modern Judeo-Christian Bible in all of its versions, including the King James Version. The verse is Galatians 1, 8 through 9 in the original Bible. In your, in the Judeo-Christian Bible, the King James Bible that most people use today, you can also find it in Galatians 1, 11 through 12. In it, the Apostle Paul states, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Unquote. Now, if you're new to all of this, Paul is referring to the revelation he received on the road to Damascus in 34 AD. And it is through that revelation that Paul was instructed by Jesus directly to write his gospel, the gospel of the Lord. And that is the gospel he preached throughout the known world as he established new Christian churches. Now, it may come as a surprise to you that he didn't preach Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. None of those even existed at that time. He preached the gospel of the Lord just as he received it in that revelation. And as if that wasn't clear enough, we learn later in 48 AD after the Council of Jerusalem that Paul preached the gospel of the Lord to the uncircumcised. That would be all of us. And Peter and James, on the other hand, preached a Judaized gospel to the Jews. You'll find that in Galatians 2, 7 through 9 in your Judeo-Christian Bible. Sadly, after the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, you wouldn't be hearing any more about this gospel of the Lord. They saw to that. No, instead, you would be left with the Judaized scraps of the anonymous authors of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, with just enough traces of the original remaining to make the modern Bible still relevant, or as relevant as you can be with less than 3% of the words in the Judeo-Christian Bible actually attributed to Jesus Christ. It's stunning that the provenance for all of this is actually laid out for people in a verse, and they just gloss over it. It's literally right in front of you in black and white. In any event, and not surprisingly, the Gospel of the Lord was not among the digitized documents released by the Vatican Library. So for the Marcionite Church researchers, they were batting 0 for 2. No antithesis and no Gospel of the Lord. These were dark days, and in my capacity as outreach director for the church, I was given daily updates on their progress. But as they say, and you can pick your own analogy here, when one door closes, another opens, darkest before the dawn, etc. It was at this moment that the phone rang in the FBN studio. They had found something. And that something isn't what anyone expected or was looking for when the search began. You see, back in the first few centuries of Christianity, if you wanted a copy of the Gospel of the Lord or the Apostle Paul's original ten books or epistles, the letters that he wrote to the first churches that he established, there were two places to get them. Either go to those original churches in Corinth, Galatia, Philippi, Thessalonica, Colossae, etc., or go to the main Marcionite Christian church in Syria, just outside of Damascus. But why a Marcionite church? Well, in the first century, the son of the Bishop of Pontus, a man named Marcion of Sinope, he was a devout Christian and very successful shipping magnate who owned a large fleet of ships for trading. And as we so often see with God's plans, he was the right man at the right time. He was uniquely qualified to get the job done. And that job, Marcion had decided, was to use his vast fleet to revisit all of the cities in which Paul had established churches and transcribe the original Greek letters Paul had sent to them. And he was going to do it in a way familiar only to mariners of the time. You see, they didn't use scrolls to document stories and items. They used something called a codex, the early forerunner in format to what we know today as books. Not only did he now have Paul's original ten letters, he also transcribed copies of the original Gospel of the Lord, Paul's revelation received directly from Christ. 
Simply put, he had the essence of Christianity in front of him in the form of a codex, a book, a book you know today as the New Testament. Of course, in the beginning, the original New Testament consisted of the Gospel of the Lord and those ten epistles. But by the end of the fourth century, under the Catholic Church, it would balloon to four different anonymous Gospels, plus Acts, 72 books, three extra epistles of unknown origin, and even had a different religion stapled to it in the form of the Torah, or as it was later renamed, the Old Testament. In short, your Judeo-Christian Bible of today bears little resemblance to what Marcion had atop his desk on his flagship in 140 AD. Now, before I tell you what happened after the phone rang in the FBN studios about three years ago, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you at least a little bit about what happened to Marcion and that First New Testament back in 140 AD. Indulge me momentarily as the circle comes to a point. So Marcion studied all this new material, laid out this new Christian Bible in front of him. That must have been quite a moment. But then he did something counterintuitive. You see, something didn't make sense, and it ate at him. It gnawed at his thoughts as his fleet traversed the sea on the way back home. He had a lot of time to think, and he had a lot to think about. And it was then that Marcion suddenly had an epiphany. Wait a minute, there is a problem. And Marcion laid out the Jewish Torah right next to that first Christian Bible, and there it was. Oh, it was a problem, all right. A very, very big problem. The more he read from this Jewish Torah and its barbaric deity ordering the murder of women and children and cutting off hands and severed foreskins from slain enemies as wedding presents, the more he read about their 613 Hebrew laws, one set of laws for them and different laws for the rest of us, and the deceptions, the lies, and the magic tricks, well, he saw right away that whoever or whatever this Jewish god or deity was, it was completely 100% different and alien from the God revealed to us only through Jesus Christ. And it was all right there in front of him, laying side by side next to each other. And the conclusion was inescapable. Now, long story short, Marcion was stunned with the implications. The Judaizers had literally hijacked Christianity and were attempting to con everybody into thinking the Jewish war deity was the same as our Christian God. Something had to be done. Actually, he decided, several things had to be done. So he started by writing a book in which he contrasted and compared the Torah to the New Testament, proving conclusively that only our Christian God is the one that should be worshipped. This was the book that was called Antithesis. He then traveled to Rome in 144 AD with the blessing of his father, the Bishop of Pontus, and confronted the Judaizers that had infested and hijacked the early church. He laid out his case, just as he had laid the Torah and Christian Bible side by side. And what was the response of then Pope Pius I after being confronted with the facts? Well, he excommunicated Marcion on the spot. Now, what would follow would be the most fantastic story you never heard of, headlined by one of the most important biblical characters you also never heard of. You see, Marcion didn't just slink away into the weeds after being rebuffed. Marcion responded to that excommunication by founding a church based on that first Christian Bible. And it would grow to become even larger than the Catholic Church itself at one point, spanning the entirety of the known world. Now, remember I told you their main church was located in Syria? It's also the church where you will find carved right above its entrance, the oldest inscription in the world bearing the name of Jesus Christ dated 318 AD with the letters carved in Greek. And in a roundabout way, this brings us back to that phone call three years ago at the FBN studios. 
You see, that's the Marcionite church in Syria that Hieronymus traveled to when he was ordered by Pope Damasus to collect all the original biblical scriptures and translate them from Greek to Latin. It was an effort that would culminate in what we know now as the Latin Vulgate, or Latin Bible. Oh, who was Hieronymus? You might know him as St. Jerome. The Catholic Church recognizes him as the patron saint of translators, librarians, and encyclopedists. He died in 420 AD. The church researchers had found not one, but 10 different documents released by the Vatican Library, all over a thousand years old, which, thanks to the meticulous record keeping that they used to do, showed not only that the Marcionite Church was the source for St. Jerome's Greek source material of St. Paul's epistles, but even reflected which specific epistles came directly from the Marcionite Church. There, on the top of each Vatican document, was the name of Hieronymus and the very man they had wrongfully excommunicated 2,000 years ago, Marcion of Sinope. The very man they had demonized and smeared as a heretic, yet had no compunction about stealing and deceitfully editing the fruits of his labor. Now, if you're listening to this episode on the pre-Nicene Perspective podcast or on FBN radio and you want to see the documents as we move forward, you can view those right now at theveryfirstbible.org forward slash Vatican dot html. There it is. Take a good look. Next to the 10 names of each original epistle citing as its source is the name Marcion of Sinope. Galatians, Marcion of Sinope. Romans, Marcion of Sinope. 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Marcion of Sinope. Philemon, Marcion of Sinope. 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Laodiceans, Colossians, Philippians, Marcion of Sinope. Even more damning, the three extra epistles of unknown origin of Titus and 1st and 2nd Timothy that were never part of the original Christian Bible are also listed but without Marcion's name attributed to them. So, where did they come from? From whose fertile Judaic imagination did they spring forth? Well, who knows? You'll have to ask the Vatican. And then, as if it were even possible, it gets even worse. You see, we have the original Christian Bible of 144 AD. We have the original Gospel of the Lord. And yes, we have the original 10 epistles from the Apostle Paul. And they look nothing like what's in your Judeo-Christian Bible of today. You see, St. Jerome did a lot more than simply translate the original Marcionite scripture from Greek to Latin. He, along with his Vatican handlers, edited and Judaized them. But don't take my word for it. Get a free copy at theveryfirstbible.org and compare the originals to what's displayed in your modern Bible. The result is a ghetto wall spray painted in Hebrew theological graffiti. Simply put, it's an abomination. I can think of no more fitting quote than the corrupt tree does not bear good fruit. And when we look at the behavior of this current pope, well, one of the popes anyway, how many do they have right now? And his endorsement of the bioweapon injections, false religions, sodomites, and his rejection of settled Christian doctrine, one asks, pray tell, who is the real heretic? But let's zoom out for a moment and reflect on current reality. A satanic wave has been sweeping across the world and virtually Every denomination has bended the knee to it, offering no resistance as the wolves devour the flock. Absent a shepherd and abandoned, at the very least, they're going to need original scriptures to guide and protect them. Not the abomination of the modern Judeo-Christian Bible with two different religions stapled together. A, a jumbled mass of confusing alien nonsense that only leads down to a path to the spiritual Dead Sea. Remember, you don't have to be a parishioner of the Marcionite Christian Church to use the original pre-Nicene Bible. The Marcionites are just one of dozens of denominations for which it is the cornerstone of sola scriptura faith. 
You can find a pre-Nicene church and get baptized. That should be a priority. Make no mistake, God's true chosen people are baptized Christians. Let your armor be God's true word and gospel. And with that, just a few random housekeeping notes. The Marcionite Church maintains a secure TOR forum, T-O-R, where parishioners can meet each other and touch base. You can find that at marcionitechurch.org. That'll be in the join section. Now, we've had people ask why we don't run ads or ask for donations on FBN. The answer is that for whatever reason, God has decided that your prayers are sufficient for our cause, and we do appreciate them, so keep them coming, please. Now, another way to support FBN is simply share the podcasts and videos on social media. After all, what could be more important than saving other Christians from false doctrine and Judaized scripture? And lastly for today, I think we've all noticed that as the Jesus killers have cemented their control over Western media, especially since the end of the 80s, early 90s, it's been a steady attack on our innocence and our inherent good nature, a drumbeat, an assault of anti-Christian propaganda, the inversion of good and evil, and it's all been by design. Now, I mention this because FBN now produces a daily news digest in print and video format that rips away their veiled propaganda and gives you the pre-Nicene view of current events. You can find that at news.firstbiblenetwork.com. I'm Darren Kalama, and you've been listening to Pre-Nicene Perspective on FBN. Kill them all, old and young, girls and women, and little children. Does that sound like something Jesus would ever say to you? The first Christians didn't think so either. And that's why you won't find the Old Testament in the first Christian Bible of 144 AD. Reconnect with your pre-Nicene Christian roots and the Bible you were meant to have. Ten books and the Gospel of the Lord. Download your free ebook at theveryfirstbible.org.